Hini Karagui. Ha. Um, how are you doing? I'm Angel Hinzo. I'm excited to be here. It makes me happy to see you all. Um, and I, yeah, I'm very much excited to be able to contribute to this conversation um, with the Indian Citizenship Act. Um, and so I'm just going to get into my talk. And this is definitely the beginning of a research paper um, that I'm hoping to develop further or that I intend to develop further um, as a chapter in a book. So that's what I'm currently working on. So, yeah, thank you. So my research focuses on Ho-Chunk history and the community's struggle to maintain political and cultural sovereignty within the United States. I'm a citizen of the Winnebago tribe of Nebraska and the United States. My sister and I are the first generation to grow up away from the Winnebago Indian Reservation in Nebraska, which is actually going to be the focus of my talk, um, the Winnebago tribe of Nebraska. Uh, it was established in 1874. So the history that I study engages with Diane Millian's felt theory and approach to Native American history. Millian argues Indigenous women participated in creating new language for communities to address the real multi-layered facets of their histories and concerns by insisting on the inclusion of our lived experience, rich with emotional knowledges, we feel our histories as well as think them. For many scholars whose work includes their home community, they may find their personal histories are interwoven with this larger historical narrative. This is initially what drove drew me to the field of history to make visible the Ho-Chunk history that I knew to be true. The Ho-Chunk were among the Indian nations deemed hostile to the United States and subject to removal from ancestral homelands following the 1830 Indian Removal Act. The square on the map shows ancestral homelands in what is now Wisconsin, and the star is the approximate location of the Winnebago Indian Reservation in Nebraska. This removal period was a time when Ho-Chunk people struggled to assert and continue traditional practices, including self-governance. The Ho-Chunk, who eventually settled in Nebraska, negotiated with Omaha people for reservation land. These Ho-Chunk were working to maintain traditional governing systems and did not see themselves as U.S. citizens. This map shows the number of removals that occurred during this 30 year period. So to really highlight that this was a series of removals over the course of a generation, over about 30 years. Many Ho-Chunk escaped removal to stay in Wisconsin. Others returned to Wisconsin to rejoin their communities. Others stayed at some of these locations such as the Blue Earth Reservation in Minnesota. And this map is actually from um, Amy Lone Tree's People of a Big Voice uh, text. Um, I forgot to include that. So these Ho-Chunk people survived brutal conditions during their removal. Starving conditions were aggravated by the United States neglect, such as denying adequate food for the population. The white settlers who argued for removal did not see the Ho-Chunk as U.S. citizens or as privy to land rights as Native nations. Settlers relied on rhetoric of hostility and argued that Ho-Chunk people were a danger to white U.S. citizens to justify removal and militia violence. This past year, two books have been published that discuss this aspect of Ho-Chunk history. Um, Stephen Kantrowitz's Citizens of a Stolen Land and Kathy Coates's To Banish Forever. My paper connects to their work and focuses on how Nebraska Ho-Chunk worked to make a home on their reservation in Nebraska. Navigating the liminal space of U.S. citizenship as a native person in the early 20th century. Ho-Chunk in Nebraska worked to maintain traditional governance, but were subject to the assimilation practices of the era, such as missionization, the presence of Indian agents, and boarding school practices. The Ho-Chunk created tribal laws and regulations before their reservation was formally established in 1874 that recognized, quote, the executive and judicial power of the tribe shall be lodged in 14 chiefs, end quote. In addition to the presence of an Office of Indian Affairs agent, these policies illustrate the tenuous nature of political self-determination during this era, where native governance was acknowledged but also denied by the United States. These early policies did not define who a Winnebago tribal member was. 
but does use the terms, quote, Indian, half-breed, and white man to differentiate between people living in the area. Within these policies, racial terms were political terms. One of the tribal members subject to these policies was my great-great-grandfather, William H. Decora. William Decora was born in 1892, 18 years after the Winnebago Indian Reservation in Nebraska was established. He was the last traditional civic chief of the Nebraska Ho-Chunk. Traditional Ho-Chunk chiefs were determined through kinship and community consensus. This is a family photo from about 1921, 1922, um, based on the age of their daughter, um, who's my great grandma, <laughs> is the baby. So this shows William, his wife, Emma, and my great grandma. Um, at the time of this photo, they had been subject to allotment policy, but were not US citizens. William DeCora is considered the last traditional civic chief since the Winnebago tribe of Nebraska would organize a US approved governmental structure under the 1934 Indian Reorganization Act which, as you know, is 10 years after following this and kind of continuing the, US, uh, the US's uh, settler state's goal of like co-opting indigenous governance. Decor was part of the first generation born on the Nebraska reservation. He attended boarding school, ran away from boarding school, worked as a farmer, moved his family briefly to ancestral homelands in Wisconsin before returning to the reservation in Nebraska. William DeCora's World War I draft registration card reveals how he identified himself at the age of 24, which is a couple years after, or a couple years before the family photo was taken. In response to the form question, are you one, a natural born citizen, two, a naturalized citizen, three, an alien, four, or have you declared your intention, specify which with a line. And on the line, he writes, I am true American. And, and identifies as Indian Winnebago for his race. So this action comments on the reality that as a Winnebago Indian person in Nebraska, Decorah was not considered a US citizen. By identifying as a Winnebago Indian, he is placing himself racially and politically within the framing of the settler state and maintaining his community and political connections with the Winnebago tribe of Nebraska. Before William Decor was born, another Ho-Chunk man, and this is a case that Wilkins just spoke about, um, John Elk had attempted to register to vote in Omaha, Nebraska in 1880. For context, this was six years after the Winnebago Indian Reservation was established. So it had only been established for six years when he was in Omaha attempting to register to vote. So John Elk is a survivor of the relocation period Elk was denied voting access by the city registrar, Charles Wilkins. John Elk would take this complaint to the courts and would argue that he was a citizen of the United States and entitled to vote under the 14th Amendment. John Elk argued that he had, quote, severed his tribal relation, end quote, met Nebraska's residency requirements and was entitled to vote as a citizen of the United States under the 14th Amendment. According to the case's filed complaint as the city registrar, and this is a longer quote, Wilkins designedly, corruptly, willfully, and maliciously did then and there refuse to register this plaintiff for the sole reason that the plaintiff was an Indian and therefore not a citizen of the United States and therefore entitled to vote. And on account of his race and color and with the willful, malicious, corrupt, and unlawful design, to deprive this plaintiff of his right to vote at said election and of his rights and all other Indians of their rights under said 14th and 15th amendments of the Constitution of the United States on account of his and their race and color, end quote. In this argument, Wilkins is accused of denying John Elk the right to vote both due to his assumption that Elk is not a US citizen, but also due to his racial logics of Indianness. John Elk argued that he had severed political ties to his community and met the Nebraska residency requirement for voting. Wilkins' refusal to acknowledge Elk's state residency demonstrates the complexity of Native American identity as an ethnic and racial identity and as a political identity. Although John Elk attempted to dissolve his political identity verbally, this was not recognized as a formal renunciation and he did not file for US citizenship. 
but I wonder, would he have been allowed to at this time as a non-white person or not as a person of African descent needed for naturalization? Uh, those aspects make this case important in immigration legal history, since there were many people who did not fall into these categories, but who fulfilled state residency requirements. The case was ruled in favor of Wilkins, leading to the decision that the alien and dependent condition of the member of the Indian tribes could not be put off at their own will without the action or assent of the United States, end quote. Under the United States laws, the status of citizenship had to be extended to Indian people and could not be claimed by leaving Indian communities and becoming state residents. For the Winnebago tribe of Nebraska, their jurisdiction and rights under the 1868 laws only applied to tribal members within the reservation boundaries. So John Elk would not be subject to these policies unless he was on the Winnebago reservation. The Winnebago tribe, as far as I know, did not have written procedures regarding Winnebago Indian people not living on the reservation. Keep in mind there were many Ho-Chunk people not living on the reservation following removal from Wisconsin. However, for those following Ho-Chunk cultural practices and traditional legal frameworks, people remain Ho-Chunk through kinship and following cultural practices, like speaking the language, adhering to clan responsibilities, uh, recognizing that they're still part of the tribe, things like that, and gain political rights by participating within the community and through community consensus. Um, individuals could be stripped of their rights as a member of the Ho-Chunk community through banishment or exile. This is a punitive measure that is still used today. The 1868 laws and regulations state, quote, if any Indian or half-breed of the tribe shall make mischief or create discontent among the Indians, it shall be the duty of the chiefs and police to report him to the agent with the view of having him removed from the reservation, end quote. During this time, the reservation police were largely other Winnebago people. Policing structures were part of traditional governance, but these reservation police also, also had to be approved by the Indian agent. Additionally, the Indian agent would have to agree to removing the mischief makers from the reservation. Essentially, for this law to function, the Indian agents needed the compliance or agreement of the Winnebago tribal members. There were opportunities for non-compliance and resistance to U.S. government uh, oversight to occur. <laughs> One of my favorite examples of this is the 1871 theft or borrowing of horses by Ho-Chunk people to visit family in Wisconsin. Omaha people filed a complaint and alleged that approximately 173 ponies were taken by Ho-Chunk between 1871 and 1882. The Omaha people filed with the Secretary of the Interior to be compensated through the Winnebago accounts for the horses taken. U.S. Indian Inspector C.H. Howard wrote regarding the investigation, quote, the horses were stolen by the Winnebagos, were taken by the Winnebagos from Wisconsin on visiting their friends in Nebraska, or they were taken by some of the worst of the Nebraska Winnebagos when they were about to visit Wisconsin Indians. There is a large party of Winnebagos known as the Dancing Indians who refuse to yield to civilizing influences. These are the ones who frequently leave the reservation and go up to Wisconsin on a visit and who entertain their friends from Wisconsin when they come to Nebraska." End quote. Howard's statement reveals the general views of the Office of Indian Affairs regarding the movements of Ho-Chunk. These movements were linked to delinquency and criminalized along with other traditional practices. These actions were also in violation of the 1868 law regarding property theft, as horses were property. However, this law was not enforceable as the agent did not know who specifically took the horses or where they were located, if they were Wisconsin, if they were Nebraskan. Um, community members, including the Omaha people, did not state names of who was involved in the incidences and did not pursue a trial or imprisonment of the accused, which were part of the policy. The Omaha uh, just asked for financial restitution for the horses and are not as concerned with the need to go beyond that, while the Indian inspector is concerned with the lack of a cultural assimilation taking place. This example of reservation oversight by U.S. officials 
illustrates the precarious legal protections offered to Native American people at the turn of the century. Prior to the Indian Citizenship Act, Nebraska Ho-Chunk people were Ho-Chunk tribal members until deemed assimilated or racially non-Indian by the Office of Indian Affairs. The incorporation of the Indian Reorganization Act in 1934 and the inclusion of blood quantum within the Winnebago Tribe of Nebraska's constitution would become a determining factor for tribal membership. By extending U.S. citizenship and restricting tribal membership, the U.S. government was able to support the cultural and political assimilation of Native American people into the United States. By declaring, I am true American on his World War I draft card, William DeCora was gesturing to the messy citizenship status of Native American people in the United States. He did not declare himself a ward of the state and he claimed his political status as a Winnebago Indian. As we reflect on the centennial of the Indian Citizenship Act, it also enables us to consider how Native nations have survived the denial of human rights and enfranchisement into a settler state built on necropolitics, fostering the political, cultural, and physical deaths of indigenous people. A lot has happened to the Cora family and other Ho-Chunk families throughout the last 100 years. This is a picture of William and Emma and their children uh, at, when they were grown in the 1950s, early 1960s. Um, the baby who's now grown, <laughs> my great grandma, is standing second from the left behind her dad. So she's that lady standing directly behind um, her dad. I love these pictures because these are not the disappearing native people in history books. These are my family members. I think being able to share this history and learning it myself was not foreseen when the Indian Citizenship Act was passed and drafted. Rather than assimilating completely into the United States, Ho-Chunk people and Native American people more broadly worked to retain cultural and political distinction, creating a unique view of national identity. Just this last year, the Winnebago, oh, actually I forgot, I added this picture. So this is me. And em so Emma lived a long life, <laughs> and so that's her holding me when I was a baby. And that's actually my great uncle Kenneth, um, who was a, vet a Vietnam veteran, um, who is seated to the furthest left. Um, I was able to visit him before his passing two years ago, before COVID. Um, that picture is probably from about 2017. Um, but yeah, so just to say, people are still around, right? <laughs> like to remember that families continue. Um, it's like, please, thank you. Um, so just this last year, the Winnebago Tribe of Nebraska and Omaha Tribe of Nebraska filed a lawsuit against Thurston County. So this is one of the lawsuits that um, Wilkins also mentioned um, before me. Regarding uh, Thurston County's electoral redistricting plans, the plaintiffs argued that the proposed plan violated the Voting Rights Act by diluting the Native American vote. Native American residents make up 60% of the total population of Thurston County and are the majority of the voting age residents. The plaintiffs successfully won their case, making this the third time Thurston County has been sued for violating the Voting Rights Act by discriminating against Native American voters. This instance illustrates contemporary realities of reservation communities and Native American voters. Although Native Americans are now U.S. citizens subject to tribal, state, and federal laws, there continue to be attempts to disenfranchise these communities. This has resulted in a situation where Native nations today must remain vigilant in protecting their political autonomy and rights within the settler state. And uh, thank you for your attention. <laughs>